Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our webinar on two issues in listed buildings that have arisen uh, in uh, recent weeks. Firstly, uh, the effect of the Supreme Court decision last week uh, in Dill and the Secretary of State. And secondly, the issue of curtilage following a very detailed review by Mr. Justice Holgate in the Hampshire County Council case, um, which was just at the end of April. Uh, we're delighted to see so many of you uh, joining the session and we hope you find the presentations uh, and the discussion uh, to be uh, informative. Uh, I'm David Elvin, Queen's Council. I'm going to chair the session today, followed uh, by my colleague and indeed my junior in Dill, uh, Guy Williams. Just a couple of housekeeping uh, points to note at the beginning. Uh, everyone's microphone uh, is automatically muted, so you don't need to adjust your local settings. Uh, we welcome questions throughout the session. Can you please submit uh, questions through the chat function, which will either be at, I think, the bottom uh, or top of your screen, depending on your setup. Uh, we'll endeavour to ask, uh, answer questions following uh, the last of the presentations. If we can't answer all the questions immediately because of pressure of time, we'll try and do so in writing afterwards. Um, please, uh, if you lose your connection, don't worry, just click the link again uh, and uh, come back in. Uh, it, uh, uh, sometimes they drop and uh, it's easy to rejoin. We'll also be recording the um, seminar uh, and it will be made available in due course after the event. Thank you. Turning first, um, to uh, the implications of the Dill case. Uh, just to remind everyone, the critical provisions uh, here, uh, and indeed in curtilage, are sections 1-1, the duty on the Secretary of State in DCMS uh, to list or to amend the list with the assistance of Historic England, and uh, the provisions of subsections 3 and 5, which deal with both the building and the curtilage issue. So far as uh, the listed building issue is concerned, the important point to note is the rather obvious one that a listed building has to be a building or form part of the land and comprised within the curtilage of the building. Uh, and uh, uh, you see the extended definition of listed building in subsection 5. Turning to the specific definition, you'll see section 91 of the uh, Listed Buildings Act imports the planning definition in section 3361, which brings in with it uh, a load of uh, uh, cases from the Cardiff rating case, which was applied by Mr. Justice Bridge in Barvis, and then applied by the Court of Appeal in the Skerritts of Nottingham case, that's number two, that's the one concerning the erection of a marquee uh, for several months. Now, in Dill, the Secretary of St the Supreme Court, uh, against uh, a, a constant position throughout, that is, the Inspector, uh, Mr Justice Singh, and the Court of Appeal allowed the appeal, uh, the Inspector had refused to allow a challenge to be made to the listing of a pair of early 18th century or ornamental lead urns, which were placed on limestone piers. They weren't in their original location, uh, but they'd been moved prior to listing to the Dills property at Idlicott House uh, as part uh, 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 of uh, a move there. They were subject to a listed building enforcement appeal and also uh, an appeal against the refusal of listing consent, listed building consent. The Supreme Court only really focuses on the enforcement appeal and doesn't really deal with the listed building consent case. Uh, as I've said, the urns and the peers had been moved several times before listing. They were then sold at auction in 2009 for 50,000, 55,000 uh, pounds, but those uh, who had purchased it could no longer be traced. And, and indeed, what could also not be traced, uh, which was remarked on by the Supreme Court, was that the decision as to list and the paperwork and the reasons for listing uh, were no longer available. Historic England couldn't find uh, the uh, paperwork. Uh, Mr. Dill, although there are uh, existing routes for seeking to have items delisted and uh, a review triggering the uh, Section 1-1 power didn't follow the statutory routes of applying either to the Secretary of State or to Historic England to review, um, uh, which is done under guidance, but appealed his listed building enforcement notice and the refusal of consent and argued, amongst other things, that the items weren't buildings. Uh, the inspector rejected uh, that point, saying that the listing was conclusive um, 
and he was upheld by Mr Justice Singh and the Court of Appeal, who agreed with the inspector and effectively said, the provisions in the Listed Building Act for appeals distinguish between those cases where you could raise the merits of listing and those where you couldn't, and they therefore agreed with the inspector that a Listed Building Enforcement Appeal, which didn't allow listing to be raised and its merits, uh, was not uh, the proper vehicle for dealing with a review of listing. Uh, these, uh, uh, as a matter of interest, these are the auction particulars that were before the Supreme Court. So you can see here um, the uh, lead urns and the limestone plinths, uh, nine feet overall. And according to Mr. Dill's evidence, they had to be removed by crane when they were sold. Uh, and there is the uh, uh, the listing particulars for one of the urns. They were both separately listed, uh, and this is peer to right. The other one, of course, was peer to left. The two issues before the court were whether, uh, in considering an appeal under Section 20 or Section 39, whether uh, it could be considered whether or not a listed building was a building and thus suitable for listing, or whether, in fact, it wasn't. And what were the criteria which were relevant to determining whether something was a building or not for the purpose of the Listed Buildings Act? Uh, the Supreme Court, is, as everybody knows, disagreed with the unanimous judgments below. Uh, Lord Carnworth gave the unanimous judgment of the Supreme Court. And of course, that has significant implications, not only in procedural terms as to when you can raise these questions, but it also has considerable significance in whether an item is a building that may be listed. Turning to the procedural aspect first, of course, uh, it's now possible as a result of the judgment for an applicant to challenge whether or not a building is properly listed by challenging whether or not he's a building within section 92 and section 3361. Um, and of course, that is a critical element of the definition of listed building. Uh, section 7, uh, which are the uh, protected provisions, will only be contravened uh, if the building is a, sorry, if the listed building is a building. Uh, so uh, the matters alleged to constitute a contravention do not constitute a contravention if it is not a building. And that enables, Lord Carnworth said, uh, such an argument to be made that it is not a listed building and therefore not open to prosecution or listed building enforcement. The difficulty in procedural terms uh, that raising this uh, as a general ability now is it is not, according to the logic of the judgment, applicable only to listed building enforcement notices. As I've already mentioned, there was a listed building consent refusal appeal. The Supreme Court doesn't really deal with that, but just expects the parties to, to mop that up after the event. But the logic of the court's judgment, which is to say, well, it's critical to a decision whether or not something's a listed building, uh, as to whether something's a building, that this appears to be possible to be raised in a whole variety of contexts, even possibly on a planning application, where section 66 may otherwise come into play to protect the uh, uh, setting uh, or the fabric of a listed building, it may be possible to say, well, you don't need to give considerable weight uh, uh, it's not in, a in, in line with the uh, uh, authorities uh, because um, uh, it shouldn't have been listed in the first place because it's not a building. The problem with that is um, the uh, procedural provisions in the Act leave listing of course to DCMS with the advice of Historic England and planning decisions and appeals are dealt with either by the local authority or by the Secretary of State uh, at CLG. Uh, there is as yet uh, no worked out procedure, not surprisingly since the judgment only came out last week, as to what is to happen if either a local authority or um, uh, a, a, an inspector uh, on appeal determines that the uh, listed building isn't a building applying uh, the guidance uh, uh, that the Supreme Court has given. And of course, uh, it's, it's fair to say that the guidance in the NPPF and the PPG are predicated uh, on the definitions uh, in the Act. The next issue that arises, quite apart from the wide variety of contexts uh, that uh, uh, appear to be uh, open to this approach, is 
what is the effect of a decision that this is not a building? Is it prospective only? Because, of course, it's not a judicial review. It's not a quashing of the listing. Does it simply trigger a prospective review and a delisting of the item if the guidance is accepted from an inspector by the Secretary of State in DCMS under Section 1.1? What if the Secretary of State under Section 1.1 disagrees with an inspector that the item ought never to have been listed? What if, I'm asking these questions simply because they, they come to mind as ones that may need to be resolved in, in uh, future months and years, uh, absent any further legislation, what if a local authority wants to grant planning permission for a development and decides that what has been listed is not a building for the purposes of the, uh, for the, purposes of the Act um, uh, and uh, grants planning permission? Of course, that then raises the difficulties that, of course, uh, you can't appeal against a grant of planning permission and judicial review doesn't consider the merits. Um, it's going to give rise to a number of tricky uh, procedural issues which need to be resolved, both as to the prospectivity of uh, uh, any uh, decision and as to the ability uh, to challenge it, uh, given that it is a mixed uh, fact and law issue as to whether something's a building, as I'll come on to in a moment. Um, the uh, uh, ex sorry, I've I've um, skipped a slide. If you'll excuse me, uh, the uh, current listing and delisting guidance, and I've just quoted it there for for reference. Um, unsurprisingly, doesn't deal with this issue. There are, as I've already mentioned, existing non-statutory procedural means of asking for a review, but no statutory route at the moment. The Supreme Court's. Uh, decision of course alters all that because it requires the point if it's raised to be dealt with. Turning then to the second issue which is potentially as wide-reaching as the procedural one at first is what is the meaning of building and indeed if you read the judgment Lord Carnworth appears skeptical of the listing of what he kept describing and indeed he did in argument I think just to uh, wind me up uh, describe the urns as vases uh, although, uh, contrary to some reports of the case, he did not reach a concluded view as to whether they should have been listed, but simply left them for later assessment on remission. And I might like to just add that those so-called vases with their listed plinths were nine feet high. Uh, the urns were, were, were enclosed and uh, of lead, not something I'm sure would readily be recognised as a vase, and uh, dated from the early 18th century, as I've noted. And indeed, as Mr. Dill's own evidence said, they were removed uh, uh, by crane, uh, uh, lifted onto the back of a lorry. This is, this is merely me uh, um, having a go back at Lord Carnworth for referring to them as vases. Of course, it, it is entirely irrelevant to the ultimate question which an inspector or the Secretary of State will have to grapple with in due course as to whether they are buildings within the uh, legal test. He says there's an important distinction between items which are listed in their own right as listed buildings and those which benefit from the extended definition, such as fixtures and curtilage structures, and curtilage guy will be dealing with shortly. In relation to items listed in their own right, he said the Skerritts test applying Lord, uh, Mr Justice Bridge in Barvis is applicable. Therefore, you have to consider issues of size, permanence, degree of physical attachment, which requires an evaluative judgment he says, in a reasonably flexible way, reflecting the facts of the individual case. In other words, it's a difficult question of judgment, and it's one that the Supreme Court is not itself going to discharge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he said Skerritts was important because it was the first time it was considered at appellate level, uh, and uh, it applied the planning test to the listed building context, and he drew attention to the uh, references to the general concepts of erection and structure. Um, uh, which are applicable across a, a wide range of cases, uh, but that if the planning decision maker directs themselves uh, uh, rationally in light of Barvis and Skerritts and looks at those factors, then the decision will normally be upheld as lawful. Hence my concern about what happens if a local authority decides that a listed building wasn't properly so listed and grants planning permission, having properly considered the Skerritts and Barvis factors. And uh, 
the court confirmed, uh, as uh, as had the Court of Appeal, that this isn't really dealing with a real property concepts. Those cases on annexation, such as Defalb, and, and, and those cases about items which uh, had been attached uh, to listed buildings, uh, they are relevant, the court said, to the extended definition, but they're not relevant to the issue uh, of the basic definition of, of building. Although, do note at the end of the paragraph, the mere fact that something has been erected on land isn't sufficient itself to make it a building. And uh, Lord Carnworth used Skerritt as a good example uh, of a marquee which took uh, many days and many men to erect and a significant amount of uh, uh, construction activity. It was assembled on site, not delivered, read readily made. I mean, one can see that as a question of fact. I mean, it, it does raise issues, as I'll come on to in a moment, with issues such as statuary or garden ornaments, which may be of substantial, um, uh, uh, substantial in nature, but not, of course, uh, uh, not, not uh, assembled on site, but uh, delivered ready-made by the sculptor or the manufacturer. And uh, Lord Carnworth also pointed out that you needed to look also at the Contravening Act under Section 7, which envisages some form of dismantling, pulling down or taking to pieces. And that, he said, appears to inform the meaning of building, which itself gives rise to issues if it's a statue and it can simply be picked up by a crane. So, the court pointed all these matters out without actually resolving the specific uh, issue of the uh, uh, the urns and the uh, limestone piers in this case, which is to be left uh, for future redetermination. Uh, but Lord Carnworth did add that it was important to note that it's not enough that an item is a special artistic or historic interest, but it must be linked to its status as a building. And interestingly, he noted that the historic interest mustn't be found merely in the object, but in its erection in a particular place. Now that's a particularly interesting remark, although it's not carried much further, because the urns and plinths at Idlicott ha had originated in the 18th century in Rest Park, and as I've said, had been moved several times, though they were in place as contributing to the setting and significance of Idlicott um, at the time they were listed. Uh, at least we assume so, because all we have are the bare details in the uh, listing particulars, uh, the documentation as to the reasons for listing having disappeared. Now, the issues raised by the Supreme Court are not necessarily those which take centre stage in the listing guidance, and uh, people will be familiar with uh, the various listing guides that Historic England has issued. For example, uh, they were reissued in 2017, there's commemorative structures, garden and park structures, street furniture, uh, and although many of the items that you see in that uh, in those guides will qualify under the application of the Skerritt's test, uh, it does raise a number of issues uh, uh, as to whether all of them will, and indeed how Historic England uh, will go about its guidance in the light of the latest uh, uh, judgment from the Supreme Court. And uh, also, as I've already mentioned, what are the implications for items which are moved from their original location prior to listing? If they've been there for many years before they're listed, is that uh, sufficient in order to contribute to the setting or it enhances the setting of the listed building? We'll have to see. This is the Commemorative Structures Guide. <coughs> um, and you'll see it covers uh, public statues, memorials, funeral monuments, cemeteries, and war memorials. There are many, many war memorials uh, which are listed uh, throughout the country. And there are plenty of examples in that guide. Similarly, you have garden and park structures, and whilst there are certain structures, such as the summer house you see in the photograph uh, to the right, which are self-evidently buildings, uh, there are others which are not, or may not be. Equally, street furniture, sorry, I didn't put the street furniture photograph on, I do apologise, but uh, it includes, as you see, milestones, lampposts, boundary walls to horse troughs, bollards, drinking fountains, question of course um, is whether those items are sufficiently substantial to come within the Barvis and Skerritt's definition and to finish I'd just like uh, to give you some illustrations from those three guides and one extra of my own devising uh, just to raise this question uh, and 
to consider where this may all lead us at the end of the day. Here you have from uh, one of the guides, you've got tombstones, which on the face of it do not appear terribly substantial, uh, may be moved without significant effort, are clearly prefabricated, and may not require significant intervention in the ground in order to erect them. How that will fare on the Barvis test uh, is difficult to tell, clearly of historic and uh, artistic interest, but whether or not they qualify as buildings may arise for consideration. The uh, Wyatt chest tomb in Egham, rather more substantial. Again, how far do you have to go to get across the, uh, the Barvis three-stage test? Perhaps the public sculpture, uh, a war memorial here, uh, uh, at the former Three Tons pub in Coventry, that appears to be integrated within the fabric uh, of uh, the, the pub. That may be more substantial, may more easily qualify under the uh, test that's now applicable. Here, interestingly, uh, is uh, a photograph of statues. Oh, sorry. Let me just uh, go back to the previous slide. Photographs of statues in Rest Park in Bedfordshire, which was the original location of the Dill, Urns and Piers. And uh, I did point out. Uh, this uh, to the Supreme Court during argument, that those statues are separately listed as well. And again, question of fact and degree uh, in all of these cases, but how far do you have to go with a statue, uh, particularly one that is prefabricated, uh, is simply its placing on plinths uh, if uh, by crane if necessary, uh, significant weight resting on its own weight though on the ground, is that sufficient for these purposes? Clearly the, uh, the uh, game larder is more of a traditional building and may, may qualify, but again, you can, you can see the sort of issues that are going to come up. The cenotaph, which is <coughs> listed, plainly very substantial, uh, plainly uh, difficult to move, plainly set into the ground, probably not an issue. However, what about the Henry Moore statue uh, at Dartington? Um, prefabricated, resting on its own weight, how big does it have to be? How heavy does it have to be? Is that sufficient to associate it uh, with the land and make it a listed building? And then some street furniture examples. Is a road sign sufficient for these purposes? Obviously prefabricated and placed in the ground without significant structure, maybe a little bit of foundation work. Is that going to be sufficient to meet the test? Um, an 18th century uh, name plaque attached to a street. Uh, is that sufficient? Uh, it may, if the building itself is listed, of course, be uh, within the extended definition of the listed building anyway, but on its own, in its, in its own right, its attachment to the building may be sufficient. What about a telephone kiosk? Definitely prefabricated, lowered into place by crane, no doubt, um, resting under its own weight on, on a form of uh, concrete pad. All these questions uh, give rise to potential difficulties depending on how far uh, an inspector or local authority or secretary of state is prepared to go. And finally, I couldn't resist this one, it's not in the guides, it's the Abbey Road Zebra Crossing with its two Belisha beacons, which may or may not be original, probably not original, which you may recognise uh, from, uh, well at least those of us over a certain age will recognise from the Abbey Road album, but it is listed. And uh, here are the key parts of the listing particulars. It was listed in 2010. It's not just the zebra crossing, but the two Belusia beacons, uh, which are not necessarily original and probably not original, uh, according to this, is simply painting stripes on the road, albeit associated with two Belusia beacons, sufficient to make it a listed building? It's a very difficult question. Uh, it doesn't look like a structure. Difficult to regard the crossing, which is the main purpose of the listing as, a, uh, as something which has been erected, as opposed to something which is simply being painted on the land. However, I don't have the details of how it was constructed. You have the details um, uh, under uh, the right, I, I've, I've extracted the key parts of the listing, I haven't put all of it in, but you see under the description, um, it appears to largely be directed at the 
the painting on the road. And if you recall under the Highways Act, um, where you have uh, uh, painting on road it's, uh, or, or, or um, uh, some form of road signals, uh, they of course uh, have a certain legal effect, but it doesn't mean that they're structures necessarily or buildings. However, these are all issues which fall uh, uh, to be considered uh, potentially in the future, and they're all problems which uh, arise from the application of the Barvis test across the board, um, which is a planning test and not necessarily uh, considered uh, in any detail uh, in the context of listed buildings until now. And uh, it's a matter, of course, for DCMS and the government and for Historic England as to where they go uh, with the issue of listing in future and how they're going to deal both procedurally with these cases and how they're going to deal in terms of guidance and the statutory definition uh, with these issues. Happily answer some questions later on, but I'm now uh, going to turn uh, to the next uh, point and ask Guy to take over on the issue of curtilage. Guy, of course, was the person who won Dill in the Court of Appeal, and of course, having been brought in as his leader in the Supreme Court, I then proceeded to lose it. So Guy, no doubt, is going to be more authoritative than I am on this issue. Guy, would you please take over? Thank you very much, David. I'll move on, because I think having a video of me and a photo on the same screen at the same time is probably a bit too much. But this talk is obviously, as David said, to consider the implications of Hampshire County Council against the Secretary of State and that was a judgment that was handed down on the 23rd of April of this year. It's an important judgment and I like it as a judgment because it takes on the challenge which has I think been ducked in earlier cases of trying to square points that have arisen in listed building cases rather than planning cases and concluding that you can't and Mr Justice Holgate has done his analysis and has been courageous enough to say that. I think in terms of what's new when you put Hampshire alongside Dill and another case we'll come to called Challenge Fencing is that at the present moment in time there is a divergence within the meaning of curtilage between what is its ordinary meaning and a broader meaning that's given in the listed building context. And it's clear that planning is an area which receives the ordinary meaning, whereas listed building cases receive a broader meaning. And the reason why I think it's coincidental and interesting to put Hampshire alongside Dill is that the effect, or some of the effects of Dill, is going to be to reduce the number of buildings that can be listed in their own right and to increase the opportunities for people to challenge a listing but the effect of Hampshire is to allow a broader approach to the question of curtilage so some of those garden ornaments may well be uh, the subject of curtilage listing subject of course to them meeting the requirements of being ancillary structures or objects that form part of the land. So I think that's why this is particularly topical. Now I mentioned in that introduction a broader and a narrower approach and that is developed in Mr Justice Holgate's judgment. But at a high level the two approaches can be identified as in this slide. The narrower approach asks whether the land which is being claimed as curtilage is so intimately associated with a building that it forms part and parcel of the building so very much an emphasis on the building which is the principle and the land which is incidental to the building and the broader approach can be described as whether the land claimed as curtilage is associated with a building in such a way that the land and building comprise part and parcel of the same entity, otherwise it's referred to as a single unit or an integral whole in some of the case law. So the land and its function is given a much greater importance and of equal importance to the building in trying to identify the whole. 
So in terms of that's the overview, um, and in order to get there, what I just want to consider is firstly, where did this ordinary meaning derive from? What is then the statutory context that applies in particular to listed building control that would warrant a different interpretation? Thirdly, to look at the key cases that give rise to that um, interpretation. And fourthly, just to see how Mr. Justice Holgate tries to bring those points together in his Hampshire judgment. Now, I should note at this stage that Mr. Justice Holgate himself has granted permission in Hampshire to go to the Court of Appeal on the basis that it is an important point um, for consideration. So what I'm saying at the moment is provisional on how that case fares in the Court of Appeal, but the analysis that Mr. Justice Holgate has undertaken, I think, is um, convincing in ascertaining that different approaches have been taken in different areas of the law. If we start then with the ordinary meaning, and the two critical cases to be aware of here are Methu and Campbell and Dyer, both Court of Appeal decisions, and both seem to start by references to the English dictionary that identified that curtilage was essentially a small area of land intimately associated with a building. And we see also in Dyer, Lord Donaldson, Donaldson, sorry, describes curtilage as always seeming to involve some small and necessary extension to that to which the word is attached. Now in Skerritt's number one, Lord Justice Robert Walker moved away from the notion of smallness, as he put it, which he said wasn't helpful. And I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think obviously physical layout is relevant. And the way through this is to recognize that being small is not a test, it's not a factor, but in many, many cases, the outcome of applying the ordinary or narrower approach will be that the extent of the curtilage is limited to land that's close to the building, subject to the question of relative size. The other point I think it's worth noting at the outset from Skerritt's is that Lord Justice Robert Walker had identified the narrower interpretation as deriving from statutory legislation in what he called a disproprietary context. So Methu and Campbell was a leasehold enfranchisement case, Dyer was a case about right to buy of a council house, and so <clears throat> Lord Justice Robert Walker thought that the narrow interpretation was perhaps justified in order to ensure that the landlord didn't have his property rights taken away from him um, without a strict interpretation. Now, Mr Justice Holgate in, in Hampshire doesn't agree that the ordinary meaning derives from its disproprietary context. He considers that to be the neutral meaning and therefore the ordinary meaning. And we'll come back to that later, but we can note for now that uh, Mr. Justice Holgate viewed the planning legislation as giving rise also to a neutral or ordinary interpretation. And so when one looks at the case law that underpin the narrower approach, I've just set out here what are probably the two most definitive statements in those two cases. I won't read all of it out, but it'll just draw attention to Lord Justice Buckley in red in Methuen Campbell. The former must be so intimately associated with the latter as to lead to the conclusion that the former in truth forms part and parcel of the latter, um, which may extend to ancillary building structures or areas such as outhouses, a garage, a driveway, a garden and so forth as reformulated by Lord Justice Norse in Dyer, but in my view saying exactly the same thing. <clears throat> um, he referred to Methuen Campbell and said that the authorities demonstrate that an area of land cannot properly be described as curtilage unless it forms part and parcel of the house or building. So narrow approach, focus on building and the relationship of the land to the building in that context. If we move to the listed building authorities, and before we do that, at the outset of his 
door, David set out sections one, three, and one, five of the listed building act, both of which have reference to curtilage. And I'm not going to go back to that slide for fear of losing my place, but it is significant that the role of man-made objects and structures that form part of the land and are within the curtilage is relevant under section 1.3, firstly to whether or not to list, and secondly, as David was looking at in the context of section 1.5, the extended definition then treats curtilage structures as part of the listed building and so as benefiting from the protection that the Act affords. So Mr Justice Holgate then considers the central listed building cases and I think it's it's very clear from his judgment that the broad approach he takes as deriving from Calderdale and so that's the most important case in my view for trying to understand this distinction and in Calderdale, as the slide says, there were as a terrace of, of cottages, a mill, and a bridge linked the mill to the terrace. Then the property was transferred in such a way as to separate the ownership so that the terrace um, was separate from the mill and the bridge. The mill was then listed, and the question was whether the terrace um, formed part of the protection that was afforded to the mill. And Lord Justice Stevenson firstly identified three factors, and I think these three factors have been applied as non-controversial in most subsequent case law as to what's relevant to the consideration of curtilage. And these are the physical layout of the listed building and the structure, their ownership past and present, and their use or function past and present. But identifying the factors obviously doesn't tell you what the approach is and the significance of Calderdale was in introducing as the basis of statutory construction what Lord Justice Stevenson identified as the statutory purpose and again I won't read all of that out but if you look at the text that's been highlighted in read that sentence the setting of a building may consist of much more than man-made objects or structures but there may be objects or structures which would not naturally or certainly be regarded as part of a building or features of it but which nevertheless are so closely related to it that they enhance it aesthetically and their removal would adversely affect it and interestingly um elsewhere in his judgment, Lord Justice Stevenson referred to that statutory purpose as giving curtilage or justifying what he called a broad approach, and I quote, and a construction which will enable the Secretary of State to exercise his discretion to grant or withhold listed building consent over a wide rather than a narrow field. So, as Mr Justice Holgate points out, this is by reference to a specific statutory code, a move towards a broader interpretation. The difficulty with that is, is this, that at first instance, Mr. Justice Skinner had tried to identify for himself the correct test. And there was this tension in the case law between what was a stricter conveyancing approach and a planning approach. And Mr. Justice Skinner said, the question for him was whether the buildings within the alleged curtilage form a single residential or industrial unit and in this instance whether the mill and terrace form part of the integral whole and the court of appeal effectively endorsed that test having regard to the three factors that Lord Justice Stevenson had identified and then they recognized Methuen and Campbell and cited the passage which I set out earlier from Lord Justice Buckley which effectively referred to the land being part and parcel of the building and although they referred to that citation as I said what they drew from it was they said Lord Justice Buckley doesn't refer to Skinner J's single unit but he does refer to his integral whole 
and he is of course dealing with a house and premises in common ownership. And so Stevenson LJ concluded, recognizing the difficulty that he had faced in considering this particular scenario. But if you look at the second and third lines, um, remain so closely related physically or geographically to the mill as to constitute with it a single unit and to be comprised within its curtilage in the sense that those words are used in this subsection. So Stevenson LJ and the wider court in Calderdale wasn't expressing itself as broadening Lord Justice Buckley's principle or taking a different approach because of the nature of the listed building legislation. They effectively appeared to have considered their approach to be consistent with the ordinary um, analysis as had been set out in Methuen and Campbell. But when Mr. Justice Holgate came to reconsider this, he said at paragraph 113 of his judgment that there's no disguising the fact that the single unit or integral whole approach of Skinner J for the purposes of listed building control, apparently endorsed on appeal, is very different from that of Lord Justice Buckley in Methuen and Campbell and of the Court of Appeal in Dyer. As I've already explained, the integral whole referred to by Lord Justice Buckley related to land which was so intimately associated with the relevant building as to form part and parcel of the building. He did not suggest that the relevant question was that posed by Skinner J, namely whether the land and the building or in Calderdale, the mill and the terrace, together formed part of an integral whole. And this is why I think the judgment of Mr. Justice Holgate is analytical and courageous. He is identifying that there has been this divergence as a result of statutory purpose. And that is, to my reading, very largely based on Calderdale, which is a point which I'd like to come back to um, towards the end. I'm going to mention Debenhams briefly because it's not really a case about curtilage, it's a case about structure within what's now section 1.5 of the Act and it confirms that the structures as are ancillary to the listed building, sorry the protection only attaches to structures that are ancillary to the listed building itself, not something that would be a principal building in its own right. The other reason for mentioning Skerritts, sorry, for mentioning Debenhams, is that there was some criticism of the breadth of the judgment in Calderdale by reference to structures and fixtures, although the court considered that the decision in Calderdale could be justified because the terrace was ancillary to the mill. Skerritts was a more recent consideration by the Court of Appeal. Um, Lord Justice Robert Walker applied the three factors that had been identified in Calderdale and concluded a stable block 200 metres from a grade two listed hotel was within the same curtilage. As I said at the, uh, earlier, Lord Justice Robert Walker took the view that the earlier cases, the narrower approach, had derived from disproprietary legislation, although it's fair to say that Lord Justice Robert Walker didn't put forward some alternative formulation as between Methuen and Campbell or Calderdale, and the court didn't appear to have found there to be a particular diversion in the case law. He did, however, as I pointed out earlier, not like the notion of smallness and preferred the language of considering the physical layout and what will be the respective roles of building and land. Update by reference to challenge fencing, um, a decision of Mrs Justice Leven, and this sits slightly uncomfortably, I think, alongside Hampshire, because in challenge Mrs Justice Leven had analysed the case law and at paragraph 18 of that judgment sets out six principles that derive from the combined body of case law that I've been talking about today and she did at paragraph 10 
note that there did seem to be varied considerations in play when considering the curtilage of an industrial building for the purpose of GPDO from the considerations in play in listed building cases. So Mrs Justice Leaven noted the tension in the case law, but in my view didn't go as far as Mr Justice Holgate in identifying a divergence of meaning between the two bodies. And following his careful analysis in Hampshire, he applied the ordinary meaning in the context of the 2006 Commons Act, which he found to be appropriate, that the word had a neutral meaning in that context, and that the narrower approach should therefore be applied. As I highlighted earlier, he did not agree that the approach in the earlier cases that led to the narrow interpretation was as a result of the disproprietary nature of the legislation. He just felt that was the ordinary meaning of the legislation and it was appropriate to give that meaning in Schedule 6 to the Commons Act. And in effect, um, the inspector in, in Hampshire hadn't done so. It's worth just noting another observation which chimes with something that Lord Carnworth said in Dill at paragraph 33, which is that the effect of the extended definition, so the role of curtilage in listed buildings, is not to list and protect the curtilage itself, but the structures and objects within the curtilage that form part of the land and have done so since July 1948. He also considered that challenge fencing should be read as a whole and that ultimately Mrs Justice Leaven had applied the ordinary planning narrower meaning that came from Methuen Campbell. So in terms of what I think is, is, is helpful, um, the way in which Mr Justice Holgate groups the authorities allows him to identify a narrower meaning, which is the one first identified by Lord Justice Buckley and Methuen Campbell. The ancillary requirement that arises in Debenhams only relates to structures and is a specific listed building legislation uh, construct and it doesn't bear directly on curtilage. The general position in relation to an assessment of curtilage is that the ancillary nature of the land to the building is relevant but not essential. Also grouping it in this way shows to me that the broader meaning derives from Calderdale where it was justified by the purpose of the legislation and what Mr. Hol Justice Holgate said was that the wider approach to curtilage in Calderdale is justified for listed building control, which is concerned to bring within its ambit structures or objects which are closely related to the building which has been listed, such that their removal or alteration could adversely affect its interest. And these are then the fact-specific findings that the inspector had heard, predominantly because he had taken the broader approach which had led to the identification of 46 hectares associated with the terminal building when he should have taken the narrower approach and that had led to other errors. Effectively he had taken the wrong approach to the consideration of relative size because he wasn't giving priority to the building and the need for the land to be part and parcel of the building. He was attributing too great a role to the land in its own right and its use and that um, effectively led to the decision being uh, quashed on both of the grounds that had been pleaded. Um, Mr Justice Holgate also makes clear that Calderdale, the broader approach, wouldn't and doesn't apply to development control. Challenge fencing is correct to apply the Methuen Campbell approach. So now, if you're looking at curtilage for the purpose of Section 55, a different approach falls to be taken than under Section 1 of the Listed Building Act. That's, that's effectively 
where we've got to. Will we stay there? I think that's obviously it remains to be to be seen. Where we've got to is that deal um, at Supreme Court level has enabled a great escape for challenge to listed building protection and firmer criteria for assessment of whether something is a building. Now this may well lead to a greater focus on whether garden objects and statuary are protected under the extended definition as curtilage protected. And for those interested in the protection of the listed buildings, therefore, Hampshire would lead to a wider uh, geographical extent of curtilage than the narrower approach. The real difficulty for me is that this has highlighted a divergence in meaning of the same term as used in the related listed building legislation and planning legislation. Now, by itself, that wouldn't be hugely problematic because you have to construe a word in the statutory context in which it's found. My reservation at the moment is to the extent to which Calderdale was a bold change in direction and understood as a change in the principle of the approach to listed building protection. And I think it is true that when one looks at the facts underlying a lot of the cases in the sphere of listed buildings, curtilage has been stretched, much more so than the case law that applies, um, for example, to permitted development rights in the grounds of buildings and the extent to which you can rely on those at possibly more remote parts of your of your garden. So I think there is that tension. My, I will be very interested to see whether or not the Court of Appeal runs with a difference in meaning between the two statutes. I think that's a very finely balanced call, although, uh, as I said at the beginning, I think that the analysis in Hampshire is thorough, as you'd expect, and forensic, um, and make sense on the case law as I read it. So it's something that one has to be aware of for the moment, and I think has to keep an eye on for the future. Guy, uh, thank you very much. Um, we'll now um, try and deal with some of the questions, and thank you very much for sending them. Uh, I, I'll, I'll kick off while uh, Guy's catching his breath. Um, I'm uh, grateful to Richard Harwood, who, of course, was the victor in Dill and who's uh, on, on this uh, webinar, and many congratulations to him for his argument, um, uh, for pointing out, of course, just so uh, no one's under any misapprehension, Dill was not an issue concerning curtilage structures. Dill was an issue concerning items which were listed in their own right, and indeed they couldn't have been curtilage structures because they post-dated um, 1948 in terms of their installation at Idlick House. So I'm grateful to Richard for that clarification. Um, question about Wales. Uh, does Dill apply to Wales? The, the answer is, strictly speaking, it does, because the concept of building in section 1.3 and 1.5 apply in the Welsh version of the Listed Building Act, as well as in the English version. What Wales has, which is, uh, uh, arguably superior to the position in England, uh, are the additions to section 1 and sections 2a to 2d, which have a statutory process uh, for notification and challenges to listing or review of, of listing, and which can require Welsh ministers to review a decision uh, to consider whether or not something is listed. That doesn't apply in England. So the, uh, the Welsh provisions, uh, although DIL applies, um, it may uh, be more relevant in the context of the application of the statutory challenge process under sections 2A to 2D of the Act as it applies in Wales uh, than in the as yet unworked out position uh, within England where the relationship of decisions on building in the planning context and their relationship with the listing review powers is as yet unclarified. Um, second question which I'll deal with uh, were asked was whether a prefabricated building brought onto site uh, is or can be a listed building. Um, certainly 
it's a point which uh, I highlighted in uh, uh, what Lord Carnworth said about uh, uh, Skerritts and that Skerritts was dealing with something which wasn't simply brought onto site but had been erected uh, over uh, several days uh, uh, and uh, at some effort. Uh, the same point arises in uh, Barvis and its adoption of the Cardiff criteria. If you look at Barvis pages 715 to 717, there's a discussion of this. And Mr. Justice Jenkins in Cardiff, which was approved in all of the subsequent cases, suggests that um, a building is something normally that you consider as being uh, built or erected on the land and not simply brought in as ready-made, but that wasn't necessarily determinative. Problem with this is nothing appears to be determinative. He says size uh, is relevant, but not necessarily decisive. He says physical attachment may be relevant, but is not necessarily decisive. And uh, uh, Barvis itself, which applied the Cardiff rating criteria to the meaning of building under the Planning Act, was dealing with a mobile tower crane some 89 feet high that ran on mobile tracks which was temporarily stationed in a depot until it was needed again that was held to be a building and uh, mr justice bridge referred to the fact it needed to be dismantled put up again uh, on site uh, and its mobility was not determinative in that case but then which worries me about the, the question of judgment that applies uh, in these cases that we keep referring to is uh, Mr Justice Bridge says at page 715, uh, this was an enormous crane, it's impossible not to think of it as a structure or erection. So you, you jump from the issue of judgment then just to a sort of issue of impression. And the question, um, uh, uh, the question then is, is to what degree uh, those issues of impression have to be uh, guided by a more detailed assessment and where it leads you. Guy, do you want to deal with uh, the question that was raised uh, about the relationship between curtilage and setting and whether the two are synonymous for these purposes. Yes, I will do. Um, there's a question referring to Lord Justice Stevenson's text at 405, which I put up on one of the slides, where he effectively relates some of the purpose of the legislation to the setting of the building and the contribution it makes. And the question is, should we therefore take setting as being um, synonymous to curtilage in this context and I don't think we can to be honest I mean I think the setting of a listed building is a separate assessment and has particular relevance um, in relation to the specific duty to protect the listed building and its setting and I obviously don't know precisely what Lord Justice Stevenson had in mind there but I think the point he was making was the ability for objects that are not part of the building itself to contribute to what we would now call the significance of the listed building although of course back then that term didn't have the same the same significance that it has that it has now so i think whether it was loose language or just the illustration of the point i certainly wouldn't equate curtilage and setting i don't think um the uh, related question was asked about section seven. What about what if you demolish or alter a curtilage uh, structure? Uh, I think the short answer is section seven applies because a curtilage structure is deemed to be a listed building under the extended definition. The difficulty in Dill, and, and, and which is reflected in what Lord Carnworth says about section seven, is, is simply moving uh, uh, an item, which is an ornamental item, uh, and uh, which is standing under its own weight is that that's not demolition is it is it an alteration or an uh, of any description is simply moving it away to somewhere else an alteration or a demolition and you can see the difficulties that that itself creates in the list of building mechanisms which appears to be why he uh, he underlined the relevance of considering section seven to the issue of building um Guy, do you want to deal with, um, sorry, let me just get my list, um, of how local authorities uh, are meant now to approach listed building cases? And it's something I might add something to when you've finished. Well, yes. I mean, in my view, um, they should look at Hampshire and take that as having um, the most up-to-date guidance. I think it's 
sometimes in these situations, a legal analysis between two rival approaches is, po is possibly capable of, of overemphasizing the difference. I mean, I, in, in a number of cases, the curtilage will be quite readily identifiable, I would have thought. But I don't know whether you disagree, David, but um, Hampshire is on appeal, but currently uh, a statement of the law, which yes. is a slightly tricky one because Calderdale is obviously Court of Appeal Authority, Metherman Campbell is Court of Appeal Authority. Scary, but I, number one, and number two is. Yeah. So yeah. it's a tricky one, but yeah. I think you look at the three factors. Um, and I think local authorities are in, entitled to apply the Hampshire approach. And, and indeed, um, uh, question practically what you do if, it's, uh, if you've got a, a case with, the, uh, with Section 66 and the implications of a, uh, of a development on the setting of a listed building. Um, in practical terms, I think a local authority is entitled to look to the listing itself as at least presumptively valid um, unless someone seriously challenges it. Uh, in most cases you will have in the listing statement uh, a reasonable amount of uh, information which enables you to see why it was listed. Um, difficulties uh, with the uh, urns at Idlicott because that material was uh, uh, very uh, limited and the original material had, had, uh, had disappeared, couldn't be found. So I think a local authority will have to approach these questions on the basis that if a listed building is listed, then, then that is uh, sufficient unless it is challenged. And if it is challenged, I'm afraid it's going to have to go through the process, uh, which is a difficult one, as somebody else points out, uh, that it carries out under uh, issues under Section 55 and related matters of whether something is a building or not. Uh, and that is a difficult question, as the Barvis and Skerritt's case show. Many cases won't be an issue, and a number of the items that I showed you by way of example from the uh, Historic England guides are self-evidently buildings, to use uh, uh, Mr Justice Bridge in Barvis, but others will require going through the exercise without any clear indicators. You're told that size may be relevant, permanence and degree of attachment may be relevant, but none of these are determinative or decisive, and you've just got to do your best to reach a judgment on the facts before you. Uh, and you may want to involve Historic England if the issue of listing is, is raised. You see, it's got, no, uh, it, it's got no necessary involvement unless it chooses uh, to be involved uh, in consultation cases, except for the more important buildings. But uh, if issues arise about the uh, validity of a decision to list because it's not a building, then clearly uh, authorities should be seeking uh, Historic England's assistance. I think the point I'd add to that, David, as well, if I may, is that there are, as you've indicated, on the basis of the Supreme Court judgment, a number of different ways in which that question may come to be addressed. Um, obviously, there is the potential for criminal liability if an act is undertaken which does amount to the demolition of a listed building. So I think if you're the, the landowner in that situation, very clearly a cautious approach to that is is going to be advisable yes um there, there are then uh two related questions which are obviously of uh, on people's minds a great deal following the uh the application of the building approach which is uh, artworks uh, and uh, and someone has raised the issue of uh, the relevance of the three graces case which is ironically one where uh, Lord Carnworth in his former incarnation as uh, Robert Carnworth QC was uh, acting uh, many years ago, uh, works of art and similar items and, and where that leads you in terms of the statutory definition if there's genuine uncertainty. First point is the works of art question and the three graces undoubtedly raises these issues, hence um, my uh, example with the Henry Moore statue and, and the like. Uh, the question is, is to what extent they fulfill the tests of building. If they've simply been put there for a greater aesthetic appreciation uh, in a garden of some description, uh, then that may be more difficult than if it's been put there as a deliberate design feature to enhance the setting uh, of the listed building. Uh, size and degree of permanence uh, and attachment may be relevant as well. 
But uh, to, to the issue of, of what happens with items of statuary and artworks and the like, which are not uh, buildings or which are, uh, may, may fall into the more difficult categories, such as the zebra crossing, it may be that the only uh, solution to this, if government considers that they ought to continue to be protected, uh, to be uh, rev revisions to the legislation. But that's a policy decision which government will have to take when it's had an opportunity to absorb um, the implications uh, of this decision. And of course, it, it does have its attention directed to other matters within the planning system at the moment, as well as generally. Guy, do you have anything to add to that? I don't think I do, thanks, David. Let me just... We are asked about how would Hampshire apply to farm buildings. That's an interesting question because I think one of the cases, the Edgerton case, to the decision of Mr Justice Sullivan, uh, raises that question exactly, where you had a barn uh, and, the, uh, 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 and the agricultural buildings as part of a farmstead in close proximity to a listed farmhouse. Guy, do you have any uh, points you want to raise about that? Well, I think the answer to the specific question is that it, it will be a case by case basis um, and it will apply Hampshire and um, you would look at the three factors and, and you would be entitled to give greater weight to the land and so therefore the farmsteading would be yeah, my yeah. initial answer. The difficulty if you look at the um, Sullivan J decision is he upholds a local authority decision that uh, that the farmstead buildings uh, were not curtilage listed with the farmhouse and took that view of his own volition as well and uh, confirmed that he agreed he not only found that the uh, authority's decision was Wednesday reasonable but he actually endorsed it he went out of his way to endorse it which is slightly odd because the farmstead is one of the examples that's given for curtilage in some of the earlier cases including i think uh, in debenhams um and it's difficult to say it's all a question of fact, but it is, I'm afraid. And what seemed to influence uh, the judge in that case was the, uh, the walls in between and, and such matters. I find it a very difficult decision because uh, it seems to me that if a farmhouse is listed, then it's curtilage, uh, depending on, on what state uh, the land is in at the time of listing. But if the if the listing is done at a time when the buildings on the farmstead are closely associated with it, it's difficult to see that it isn't a curtilage structure. But if, of course, the ownership has become divided after, uh, before listing, uh, then that may make a different, uh, uh, lead to a different result if you look at what Lord Keith says in Debenhams about the need for them to be uh, uh, operated uh, together as part and parcel of the same, uh, uh, the same area of land. But uh, farmsteading is quite a difficult one. One would have thought it would flow that they were part of the curtilage, but it does depend on the facts, as the Sullivan J decision indicates, which is not a satisfactory answer. Could Historic England assist in giving greater clarity uh, on the issue of curtilage? Well, um, there, are, there is a, a guidance document from Historic England uh, about uh, curtilage, and it, and it has a series of diagrams uh, in a, a series of annexes which show uh, the possibility of, of certain items being within or without curtilage. There, there are quite a few, uh, there are, I think at least eight examples, one of which is based on skerrits with a, stab a remote stable block designed by the same uh, architect. Uh, so they have given a fair amount of guidance on curtilage already. And unless the Court of Appeal does otherwise, Guy, do you agree that uh, the position on curtilage remains as set out in in the listed building skerrits uh, and calderdale as modified by skerrits yes yeah and, so, I, I, and the whole day analysis Mr. Justice, it is it is quite interesting yes yeah um i think uh, if uh, if if uh, that's convenient i think that probably uh, is is enough for the moment we'll check through the questions that uh, everyone sent uh, and if there are any further matters uh, that we can usefully uh, answer that we haven't touched on, I hope we've covered most of the main issues, uh, we can uh, uh, circulate those uh, answers uh, uh, by uh, email at a later stage. Thank you everyone for attending and uh, I hope uh, you found it helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much.